<clears throat> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, love to join us here with these that are here this morning. You're more than welcome at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Uh, I haven't been getting a whole lot of views, and I think one of the reasons is, is that I'm not able to post it to my to my church page, which is Calvary Chapel Inland. For some reason, my Facebook isn't allowing me to post it there. I used to be able to uh, go to my, I don't know what it's called. There's a page where you just hit those lines and it shows you your personal and if you have any other pages and it's gone from there. So I don't know how to get that back. So if anybody in Facebook knows how to do that, let me know so that uh, you can maybe walk me through that. But thank you for joining us today. We are in Hebrews chapter seven. Let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to just bless uh, the nine of us that are listening. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to just begin the day hearing your word, Lord. And as we finally look at uh, this person, Melchizedek, uh, Lord, through the writer and author here, uh, Father, who he is and what Abraham uh, did, Father, uh, to this priest, Lord God, and how we have a greater priest uh, than Melchizedek, Lord, and that is Jesus Christ himself, Father. We pray that you minister to us, Lord, and if anything, Lord, out of today's devotion, Lord, that you will remind us of how much Jesus loves us and how we have someone in heaven who understands our pain and suffering, our trials and tribulations, our temptations, Father, and even our wants, Lord. He understands these things. Not that he sinned or fell into them or gave into them, Lord, but but Lord, he understands the temptation of it all, Lord. Thank you that, um, that Lord, you, you understand me. And Lord, that you can give me strength, Father, to resist these things. And or if I don't resist them and I fall, Lord, that you can forgive me, Lord. And I thank you for the forgiveness that you have for us every day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we are in Hebrews chapter 7. Good morning, Diane. Diana. Let's see who else is here. Patty, good morning. Glad you guys are faithful too that are on this morning. We're in Hebrews chapter 7 if you want to grab your Bibles and turn there. <clears throat> and we're going to look at Melchizedek as the writer <clears throat> here describes him. Now he's been mentioned several times in the last few chapters kind of just preparing us to get to know who this guy is. And if you're, uh, if you're the first time reader of Hebrews, you're going, who is Melchizedek? Who is this guy? Why do they keep mentioning him? So if you want to read about Melchizedek, you have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 14, and get to know who he is. All of a sudden, he just appears out of nowhere with, with no genealogy, no father, no mother, no beginning, no end, and he is a type of Christ that appears in the Old Testament to Abraham. And Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. Uh, through him, God made a promise that the Abram had a covenant that was through him that would there would be an increase in his seeds and his generations and Israel would be birthed through him. So through Abraham came Isaac, Isaac came Jacob, Jacob became uh, the forefather of the 12 tribes of Israel, his 12 sons. So a <clears throat> little bit of history there. 4 verse 1, this Melchizedek, king of Salem. So first thing we know, he was a king. He was a king there in Salem, uh, or in that area of Mesopotamia, um, or the land of Ur, uh, where Abraham probably was. He was a priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. So Abraham had, you remembered, rescued his nephew Lot from kings that had kidnapped him. And Abraham chased after them and uh, whooped their butts and then brought back all the uh, booty uh, resources along with his nephew. And so he gave a tenth to this king of Salem, a priest of the most high God. He blessed him. And he says, he, and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being, being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So a few things there is that we see tithing um, being exercised before the law because Abraham was before the law. 
Law didn't come until Moses, until, the, until Abraham had uh, Isaac and then Jacob had the 12 children and then 12 children were in the land of Israel, uh, Egypt for over 400 and something years that they were in Egypt and then 400 and something years, I, I would probably guess around 500 years later, then the law came in. And then the law through the Levitical, we saw just recently on Wednesday night, how the tithes were to be given to the priests and then the priests were to tithe. That was when uh, it was, I don't want to say added, but it was already there as a law. And we have to understand this because where did the law come from? Where did the law come from? It's always been God's heart. These things that God has established as a law in Exodus chapter 20 and 30, uh, these things have always been true before that. They've been about, about God's heart. There's been what you would call an oral law. So when God told Cain and Abel, you know, you shouldn't kill, that, that was part of the commandments that came later. So it was like these commandments were always there, and then God now wrote them down. Okay, guys, I'm going to be very clear. Here are the commandments, one, two, three, four, five through ten. And this is what you spoke. We've always had them, but now I'm writing them down so you see them, and now you understand that these are commandments that I have given you even before I'm implementing them as a legal document between you and I. So they've always been a part of the lives of the children of Israel and how they ought to live their lives in a moral sense. In a righteous sense. So tithing was, before the law, tithing was always that part. It, Adam and Eve had to tithe. It's just always been that way. And again, for me, I think that the evidence is clear from Genesis all the way to Revelation that as God's people, we are to tithe our tithe. And so Abraham, knowing this before the law, because of the oral law and because of tradition that has been passed down from generation, he knew he needed to tithe. And so he gave a tithe to this king, to the king of Salem, to the king of righteousness, to the king of peace. And this title sounds a lot like Jesus, right? Uh, Jesus being the king of peace, the king of righteousness. So it's pointing to Jesus Christ. And our tithes go to Christ himself. When we give, we give to the Lord. Now, it says in verse 3, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now we have to understand the word like there. Now he's saying like or, or, or like a type. So he is a type of Jesus Christ that is to come. Abraham was giving to Melchizedek as we do to Christ today. Melchizedek represents a priest as Christ represents the priest today to us. He was the king of peace as Jesus is our king of peace. So he's a type of Christ. And there's something better coming that Abraham was pointing to, and that would be the Son of God, as it says here, like the Son of God. Uh, there are some that argue that Melchizedek was Jesus pre-incarnate, that that was Jesus Christ in the appearance of Melchizedek. Others argue that no, he's a type of Jesus Christ that pointed to the Christ that would come, and Christ means anointed one uh, by the Lord. It doesn't. It's not his name, but Jesus is his name. We don't know his uh, his. They really didn't have last names in a sense, but it would, it would have been Jesus, the son of Judah, because he comes from that line. So, <clears throat> verse 4. So knowing this now, now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriot Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils or the plunder. So here's this man, Melchizedek, a priest, king of righteousness, uh, king of peace, and Abraham gives him a tithe. Um, there was no temple at that time to give tithes to, so it went to this, this priest. And if this priest was worthy enough to receive this tithe, and Abraham was a child of God, called of God, and then would be later used to bring in the seed, because this is now after the promise was given to Abraham, he's left the land of Ur. He's now in his own land, the land of Canaan, which he's to conquer, and his nephew gets stolen. And by the way, his, his nephew was never to go with him, but Abraham wasn't obedient in that sense. He brought his nephew with him, and that was the trouble. But if Melchizedek was worthy enough to receive the tithe, then how much more worthy is the one to come? That is the Son of God. Look at, look at verse 5. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, having a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. So, we just read this, right, on Wednesday. He's talking about Leviticus chapter 18. 
and how God commanded through Moses to tell the people they're to give their tithes to the priest. And then the priests were to give of their tithes to the, to the Levites in the building of the temple, right? And, and this is, in a sense, through Abraham, right? Because Abraham gave a tithe of Melchizedek, and now that's continuing on in the law. It's being shown that now the children of Israel need to give their tithe to, to the priests also. And then he goes on, verse 6, But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So here's Melchizedek who's not part of the Israelites and yet he received a tithe and he was able to bless Abraham beyond measure just like Christ blesses us who's not a part of in a sense humanity but though he was born a man but he's God in the flesh he's deity and yet he blesses us because we support and we give you know you were saying earlier I can't believe how God just blesses me and it's probably because you tithe because you're faithful to give to the Lord and so he promises us a, a blessing that comes with that and so he's the blesser and Abraham's the one that was obedient to, to give to that. And so he received the promises. Now, verse 7, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Uh, here, mortal man received tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Wow, that's interesting. Again, you know, people say that tithing isn't in the New Testament. We're talking about tithing right now. <laughs> you know, you, you hear these pastors and, you know, they're like, oh, tithing's not in the New Testament. We don't find it in the New Testament. We find it in the Gospels. We find it here in Hebrews. And, and here it's saying, look, if, if, if Melchizedek received it and then he blessed Abraham for it, and yet here we give our tithes, because that's what he's saying here. We give our tithes to God, to Jesus Christ, which tells us then he must be a person that exists because we're tithing to him. That's evidence that Jesus exists, and that's his point here. That's why we tie them, because he exists. And so it's evidence uh, of the uh, existence of this person, Jesus Christ. And so again, I think that uh, this is evidence that we as believers should be, should be tithing. You know, just because the Bible doesn't mention it doesn't mean that it's not true. Like the Trinity. It doesn't mention the word Trinity at all in the Bible, but do we see a Trinity throughout scriptures in the New Testament? Yes, all over the place. And so I believe same is true in the, of tithing. In the Old Testament, we see it before the law, we see it during the law, and now we should see it during grace, and we see it during grace. So I don't think that Paul has to come out or say, you should be tithing as a Christian. I think it's just a gimme. that Everyone knew this. The Jews knew this. You think that the Jews all of a sudden stopped as soon as they realized Jesus was the Messiah? You think they stopped tithing? No, it was part of their heritage. It's a part of the commandment. It's a part of what they knew to do, and they continue to do so. Then he goes on, verse 9, even Levi, who received tithes, pay tithes uh, through Abraham, so to speak. Now, and what he's saying was, is that, that because Abraham paid tithes before the law, and now the Levites are to pay tithes, they're, in a sense, they're following in the footsteps of Abraham, their father. For he was still in the loins of his father, when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? So he asks the question here. Look, if the law was so perfect, even though we see tithing, and he uses the, the, the illustration of tithing before the law and then given to the law, to the priest, and then the priest were to tithe. If it is so perfect, then why did we need something better than that? Because the law was perfect in the sense that it showed us that we were sinners. We couldn't keep the law. We couldn't keep the law. And so we need something greater than the law. And that greater was a type of Melchizedek. It would be Christ himself. For the priest being changed... Of necessity, there is also change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law 
of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies. Now, who's he speaking of there? Jesus. Jesus. It's clear, right? You guys see that, right? I don't even have to explain that, right? I mean, that's just so clear to a spirit-filled person that, that he's speaking of Jesus there that is far greater than, than the commandments or the laws of God. And so for, through him, he testified, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So you see the explanation of the law there? It's very clear. The law couldn't make us perfect. We could try to follow it all we want, but as soon as you break it, James says you break one part of the law, you've broken the whole law. So we're, we couldn't be perfect by the law. So something greater came. That is through Jesus Christ. Didn't nullify the law in the sense that there are good principles to live by because the hope of the law is that we would love God with all our mind, high, and strength. We, we go to go to church every day. We would not steal. We would not lie. We would not covet our neighbor's good or our neighbor's wife. You know, that we would not hate. We would not murder. That's the hope of the law. And thus we fulfill it through the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. Isn't that amazing? We don't have to be under the law anymore, but we are in the law. Paul himself said, I, I follow the law. Paul said that, I follow the law. Well then, well, then if he's not under law, why is he following? Because there's principles to follow. It's good to follow the law. But he didn't say, I'm saved by the law. He said, I'm saved by Christ, something much better than the law. For, one, for on the one hand, there's, no, let me go on. Let me go to, I jump back. Uh, verse 21. No, actually verse 20. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and all not relent and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's in Psalms 1. 10 verse 4. So, by much more, Jesus has become a surety or a guarantee of a better covenant. Of a better covenant. What is a surety or a guarantee? <clears throat> now, and a better covenant than the law, right? Because he's comparing the law and grace through Jesus Christ. What could be better than the law? Grace. Uh, and the guarantee is Jesus Christ. He guaranteed us the righteousness that we needed to enter into heaven. Today, when you deposit your money into your bank account, let's say you make a whopping, you know, $5,000 a month, and you deposit that into your account, <clears throat> you're guaranteed that that money is yours and that it's there for you to withdraw at any time that you need it. There's a guarantee there. Even if the bank goes bankrupt, you're guaranteed that you'll get that money. Uh, it's insured by the government. Uh, so that is the guarantee of you receiving that money. Up to, I uh, hear, $250,000, you're guaranteed. Anything above that needs to be in another account in another bank in order to have that insured. You've got to spread your money uh, apart. For those of you that don't know that, and you've got over $500,000 in one bank account, you're going to lose half of it. So if it goes under, so you have it spread across. That's the guarantee that the bank gives you. So what guarantee do we have of our eternal security? The guarantee is Christ Jesus, that his righteousness has been imputed to us. And so though we can't keep the law and we fail in keeping it, even to this day, we still can't keep the law. And so what guarantee do we have then to go to heaven? It's the guarantee that Jesus' death on the cross and him taking our sins was enough to pay the debt that we insured even if the law fails uh, completely. <clears throat> so a beautiful guarantee through Jesus. How much do we need Jesus? A lot, right? A Amen. whole a lot. So far much better, right? But he, verse 24, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the utmost those who come to God through him. Through who? Jesus. Through Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no one can get through the Father except through me. Paul said in Timothy three sixteen, 
There is one mediator between God and man, and that man is Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. What is Jesus doing? Praying for us, even right now, forever. He is constantly praying. He sit at the right hand of the Father, and he's praying for you right now. He's thinking of you right now. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're suffering, he's praying for you. He's praying for strength. He's praying for perseverance. He's praying that you will make it. In fact, he knows you will because he's chosen you. And God doesn't choose garbage. <clears throat> God chooses winners, and you're a winner in Christ Jesus. You're not a winner in yourself, nor will you ever make it yourself. But if you grab onto him as a life jacket, you will make it through. You need Jesus Christ. It's through him since he lives forever making intercession. For such a high priest was fitting for us, verse 26, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Now this is like a praise song that all of a sudden he just got excited, you know, and, and he's like thinking, oh boy, this Christ and what he did and for us, and he's in heaven and he's praying, and then all of a sudden he goes, in verse 27, you know, uh, high priest who offered a sacrifice first for his, for his own sins and for the people. And then he once died for all that he was offered up in himself and for the law appointed as high priest. Men who have weakness, but the word of oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Undefiled, separate from sinners, has become higher than the heavens himself. That is our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he has done on the cross. Why would people reject him? I don't know. <clears throat> I think there's an arrogance in people's lives. They don't want to be told what to do. Amen. Nobody wants to be told what to do. We're raised like that in our society. They train our children to be disobedient. They tell our children that you don't have to follow your mom and dad. You don't have to be obedient. And in fact, if you don't like what they're doing to you, it can be considered abuse and you can call the authorities on them and have them arrested. You know, that Hitler did the same thing. He turned the kids on uh, the parents, you know, and was able to, um, to uh, defy families through the process of educating the children to be defiant to their parents. And we're doing that today. I don't know if you know this, but here's some politics for you. I know some of you don't like me because of the, I speak of politics sometimes. Uh, that's too bad. You'll stand before God one day. I'm just saying you'll stand before God and he's going to tell you that everything in the Bible is about politics. When you look at the Old Testament, uh, God created a nation and a nation needs a leader. And a leader is a political leader like a king, like a president. And he created Saul and David and Samuel and all of these kings to rule over Israel. That's politics, guys. Wake up. Read your Bible. Stop listening to other Christians who tell you that politics aren't in the Bible and that the church should be separate from, from that. That's garbage. I know I'm getting a little tough here. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just because so many people leave our church because I get into politics. But here's politics for you, and this is why we have to be involved in politics. Right now, because of this, these uh, laws and by the school boards, uh, unions, who are trying to teach our children no longer biology, just what biology is. In other words, where do babies come from? But now they're telling you, how do you have babies? Let me show you how to have babies or let me show you how not to have babies by having this type of sex or that type of sex. And they're giving illustrations and they're training their kids to do this stuff right in front of our eyes without telling us about it. And then we're wondering why our children are coming out of school with two, three, four abortions, which there are Planned Parenthoods on campus ready to take your child without you knowing and having an abortion. Without you knowing, that's politics, but you don't want to be involved. You want to blind your eyes to it. And they're doing that right now. And they're pushing, they're pushing this agenda in the school districts, on your kids, and they're telling, and they're making to the point where this is their civil rights to have abortions, uh, to be taught these things. That, and if your parents say that you shouldn't go through that class, that they're violating your civil rights. That's ridiculous, guys. 
That is ridiculous. And unfortunately, it's because the church is silent and we sit by the wayside and we say, well, that's not our responsibility to be in politics. You know, I just want to live my, my, my little life, you know, doing my job and raising my children. No, well, you can do that. You can do that. But you're going to raise children that don't believe. And you're going to see your children fall away from the wayside. All it takes is one generation. One generation and your children are gone that quick. You know that when you trace the, the lineage of Israel, you'll see that generation, that cycle. It was that one generation that came out of Egypt that disobeyed God and going to the promised land. That whole generation needed to disappear before a new generation came through. And you see that cycle constantly happening. Someone can bring revival to their family in a dramatic way, life-changing. Their whole life changes and people get saved in their family, an extended family. And then that generation can see that excitement and they can grab onto it. They're not as excited, but they believe it and they grab onto it and they get involved in it. But they're not doing what that first generation did with their kids. Because that first generation is pouring into their kids, they're reading, they're studying their Bible, they're explaining things to them, but then for some reason they lack that. Uh, because they've had it, they understand it, and they assume that their children must understand it and have it too. And that's not something that we assume, you have to do it. And so then they forget to do those things. And so by that third generation, when it comes, it's weakened at that point. And those children, which would be my grandchildren, are in the weakest state. And from that point on, it will be downhill if they don't change and revivals in their, in their heart. And, and I really believe that, that in one generation, your family structure can completely change. And also go the other way around too, right? Because you get rid of that generation and bring in a godly generation and a whole nation can change. So it's never too late. And if Christians were to stand up and vote, even in California, you know, they always say California is a democratic uh, state. And it's always going to be, is it red? or Yeah, red, right? Blue it's, is Democrat. Or blue for Democrats. Boo for Democrats. So, boo, I mean blue, blue, okay. I thought you said boo. <laughs> so, blue is for Democrats, right? And they say California is a state of Democrats. But the only reason that it is is because Christians don't vote. Two-thirds of California, which are Christians, don't vote. And if just another third of them voted, we would become a red state that quick and just one generation of Christians would vote but they're lazy they're unbiblical they've got their own little kingdom and they don't want it destroyed they want they want someone coming in here and changing it and unfortunately we're seeing the results I just saw a post post from somebody with the fires and there's this this uh, rally going on and they got this big old sign and it says we don't want God in California big old sign we don't want God in California and that's what we're getting. We're getting no God in California. And if we keep pushing that, God is going to say, see you later, guys. I'm going to leave you to yourselves. So Christians need to stand up. They need to get political. And they need to vote. And they need to make their voice known in their community, in their governments, in their police stations, wherever they're at. They need to. That is our God-given right in this state. That's how we were founded. And if you don't understand that, then you're blind. You're blind to that truth, and you need to wake up. You need to read your Bible and really understand it, and stop listening to other people telling you what to do. Don't even listen to me. You read your Bible, and you find out that these things are true. Anyway, such for a devotion this morning. <laughs> God still loves us. Uh, he still has a plan in spite of us, and it's going to be fulfilled. And I pray that those that don't know Jesus Christ, that they come to know him is far greater than we could ever imagine. I don't know how to explain that to you. I know that he's life-changing. Uh, you might sit there and say, that's good for you. It's not good for me. No, it's good for all of us. It's good for the state if we were to repent and turn back to Jesus Christ. Consider these things. Amen? Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, please post them, and we will pray for you. Heavenly Father, bless, bless our day, Lord. Lead us and guide us, Father. May we walk with your spirit and truth and righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys.